Thank you and welcome to the third lecture in our series, Ancient Egypt, Future Tense. I'd like to take a moment to thank the Department of Egyptology and Assyriology, the Joukowsky Institute for Archaeology and the Ancient World, and the RC New England chapter for sponsoring the series. I'm happy to introduce tonight's lecturer, Dr. Nadine Muller, who is an associate professor of Egyptian archaeology at the Oriental Institute, University of Chicago. Her research focuses on settlements and urbanism, and tonight she'll be talking to us about ceilings at Tel Edfu, where she's been the field director for a number of years. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nadine Muller. Okay, thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Let's see. Oh, it doesn't work. Okay, well, I'll just speak up then. Well. <laughs> Thank you very much um, for inviting me and Emily for this um, really good organization of everything. Um, the talk today is actually, well, it, I adapted it a little bit to the topic of bringing in archaeology and text, bringing them together and um, um, trying to see whether we can actually reach um, sort of more, f yeah, well, new conclusions to a very interesting period of ancient Egyptian history. Now, I should also say, um, last uh, summer, there was a workshop on specifically this topic, which brought together all the experts um, from different excavations um, working in Egypt who had to deal with this specific period, the Sangnit Hamidid period. And I apologize in advance if this is going to be a bit Egyptological. I'll try to keep it sort of um, uh, more broad for the non-Egyptologists amongst you. Um, so we had this workshop in Vienna to bring together all the um, archaeologists focusing on this specific period um, because with this discovery from Tel Edfu, there are actually a lot of questions that, are, um, new, newly, that have newly opened up and need to really, uh, we should really reconsider this, this specific period and um, some of it actually might change um, yeah, the history of the time and um, what's available in the textbooks right now. So I hope by the end of this, I would be very interested in discussion. And uh, please don't hesitate to answer any questions, uh, ask any questions, and I will try to answer them. So um, the, um, the talk will start with, I'll give you the archaeological context of the specific um, ceilings called the Chayan ceilings, who was a Hyksos ruler ruling in the north of Egypt. Um, so we have. Uh, discovered a few years ago, we, we discovered quite a, a nice corpus at Tel Edfu in the south of Egypt. Then the second part will be what is the archaeological evidence, the context from the much more famous site uh, for the Hyksos rulers at Tal Daba. And um, those of you who know um, Miriam have probably heard a little bit um, about this. And then uh, what are the chronological and historical uh, implications? So let's start with Edfu. So the site I've been excavating since um, 2001 is situated in southern Egypt. It's a Tel site, and it was, it was actually a regional um, capital of the, uh, we call it second Egyptian nome or province. So it's pretty much in the south of Egypt. And um, the site is a Tel site, and we have basically remains dating back to the third millennium BC up to the Roman period. Um, as you can see from this image, the site is uh, not in the best of all conditions because a lot of tell sites in Egypt were actually destroyed by um, people in modern times digging um, these abandoned, often abandoned mounds for fertilizer and leaving these enormous gaps. And you can see the, this is the ancient, what remains of the ancient tell just here sort of T-shaped. This, all this space here has been now an open, converted into an open air museum and basically the archaeological remains are lost. Uh, you, you can also see that some of the ancient site is under the modern town of Edfu up here. And um, Edfu is most famous actually for this magnificent stone temple that dates to the Ptolemaic period. So um, our excavation area um, that actually uh, revealed these, uh, this corpus of ceilings is situated uh, in this area here, which is our zone one. Meanwhile, we have actually moved on and we have now different um, areas over the past few years, but I really want, today I want to focus on, on this area. So um, as it's a tell site, so you have to, uh, you have all these different occupational phases lying on top of each other. And those of you who do um, urban archeology span know 
very well how complicated it is to excavate a site like this where you have constant rebuilding and constant phasing but um, a pretty much complete uh, stratigraphy which also is actually opening a lot of opportunities to understand um, urbanism and development of uh, such a provincial capital in the long term. So I'll go through, it, it's really important to get a good idea of what the archeo archeological context is and I will start with the various phases in this specific area. So the oldest phase dates to what we call the first intermediate period. So intermediate periods, for those of you who are not so familiar with Egyptian history, are times when Egypt was ruled by different power centers, by different rulers at the same time and it was not a unified country. Um, so at this time we already have an administrative um, complex in this area. We don't know that much about its architecture because it's sitting underneath um, later remains, but um, we have good evidence for uh, a lot of uh, clay ceilings that were found, especially in large uh, fillers like this one, uh, which you can see here on the, on the picture. So this is pretty much the earliest um, layer we have dug. It's not really possible to go much deeper because then we have to start destroying things that are on top and you know, you have to make a decision at some point what you want to preserve in the long term and what you want to um, excavate and basically um, destroy in a, in a way. So that's the, uh, the earliest part. Then um, uh, important for us today, uh, this administrative complex, which is actually um, a columned hall complex, probably the um, center, the administrative center of ancient Edfu, um, the seat of the local governor, um, which is basically characterized, we only have a part of this building. It, it's um, characterized by two columned halls. Um, dating to um, the 12th and 13th dynasty. Uh, in terms of absolute dates, I put sort of rough estimates um, to some of, the, some of the slides, but absolute chronology in Egypt is still a bit of a problem because as you might, be, as you might know, we cannot take out um, samples for radiocarbon dating. We can't take it out of the country. So um, if you want to use you know, uh, new up-to-date AMS technology for radiocarbon dating, having short-lived samples, you can actually, you can't actually do it. And it's a, it's a big problem, and that's why a lot of times our absolute dates are not particularly good, I have to say. So this is the, this is a plan of the columned hall complex. Um, so you have a southern columned hall uh, down here, uh, partially excavated, this area to the um, east is actually not really possible to access right now. And then to the north, another um, large calm hall. And I'll come back to this um, in more detail, but just to give you a, a general idea. Then this um, uh, building was abandoned. Um, we can now be uh, pretty precise when it was abandoned in the early second intermediate period, which is actually uh, the first time we can really identify this um, time in Upper Egypt quite precisely, mainly based on ceiling evidence and um, ceramic evidence. And again, I will come back to that. Uh, this is specifically visible um, in the, this is the, the northern column tall, um, and you ignore these round structures for a moment. So you have a, a mud floor here with a bench system. And um, this is where we found the so-called Hayan ceiling. So again, I will, I will talk about this a bit more detailed. Uh, so once that administrative complex was abandoned, we get um, a brief interv interval of um, sort of squatter occupation. So some part of that building was completely abandoned and we have a very nice sterile layer of sand uh, covering the remains. And then in, in other parts to the south, we get this kind of occupation, which you can see from here, various uh, fireplaces, um, nothing really, no formal architecture of any sort, um, small, thin walls, and this period on, doesn't last for, for very long. And then the whole area is replaced by these enormous grain silos that date very clearly to the um, late second intermediate period, 17th dynasty, when the Thebans um, were actually uh, ruling Upper Egypt. And um, it goes into the uh, early 18th dynasty, so the early New Kingdom. And um, this was the major grain reserve of the town at the time. So you can really see the evolution of an administrative quarter uh, from around 2100 BC up to um, 1550 BC. So that gives us a, a very nice um, time frame. And we have 
all, all the stratigraphy, all the phases are intact and are um, there, which makes it really um, great for, for studying um, further details. And here is a sort of overview. You can see there are various phases of these silos. I don't, I'm not going to go into this more in depth now, but um, it was, yeah, it's a major, uh, it's not a private grain storage area. Some of these silos have a diameter of 6.5 meters, so they are enormous, enormous um, installations. Um, and you can very nicely see from this image also the underlying column tall uh, building with like some of the column bases still in situ, some ripped out um, and being reused. So let's go back to the, to the administrative building, which is nice um, Middle Kingdom, a Middle Kingdom phase. Uh, again, you can see here um, the southern column tall with various of these uh, sandstone column bases in situ. Some of them, we only have the negatives because the stones were re reused later on. Uh, here's a, a plan. Um, again, I've actually changed the orientation. So we have the west over here, the eastern side here. We have the southern hall, which is actually marks the end of the building. Um, and then a, another column tall to the north with uh, larger column bases, but none of these were actually found um, in situ. Uh, architecture like this for an administrative complex, very, very difficult to find comparisons for because we're in the south of Egypt and there is almost no other site that has anything um, of that kind of yeah, size or layout. Uh, the closest parallel I have is from a Nubian fortress, actually, which, well, that's also not like the ideal comparison I would like to see, but um, f that's what it is for the moment. So um, this column tall uh, complex, especially the southern column tall, uh, is mainly characterized by a mud floor that was renewed on a regular basis. So I have about 30, more than 30 um, renewal phases on this floor. It's extremely compact, extremely thick. And um, the, the first ceiling evidence I can do something with, or is quite interesting, was actually comes from um, sealed archaeological context. You see these little holes in the floor, um, which were actually covered by um, later uh, by f uh, floor uh, phases. So um, it's just during a um, a brief moment in time, they had these holes in the floor and they actually used those to um, put large pottery jars to make them stand upright. They sort of, um, yeah, cut little holes in the floor, put the pottery jars in, and then once that fell out of use, they would just fill the trash, uh, sweep, sweep the floors clean, put the trash in the hole, and put a new layer of floor on top. So perfect, perfectly sealed context. Um, you can also see actually from this one here, um, we can sort of reconstruct the, the, the columns that once stood on top of this. You have the negative, which is an octagonal column, probably made of wood. I'm pretty sure these were wooden columns. And um, the last phase of this mud floor was actually, had grown so high that it was covering part of the column base. So you get really a very nice phase of, of renewal here. So in one of these holes, um, several of these clay ceilings were found. Um, and you can see the standing figure of a king and you have a little cartouche in front of his um, face, which actually can be identified as Amenemhat III of the 12th dynasty. And um, as I said, uh, mentioned to you just now, this context was then sealed by um, two, at least two um, layers of mud floors. So we are really in the middle of the use or, well, towards the end of the use of the building, but it's not really nothing to do with the abandonment of the structure yet. Um, now, I should also mention, it, just because I have this king and his name doesn't mean that this is necessarily 100% contemporary, because this king was also sort of venerated um, after his death. And um, these kind of round ceilings uh, made with um, scarabs are not necessarily the sort of institutional seals in Egypt. So we can't say that this is something that's directly related to the royal residence, but it's, um, in fact, interesting to have in this very specific um, sealed archaeological context. And it gives us at least um, a terminus postquem. Actually, with the ceramic evidence, we are pretty much in the 12th dynasty, so it fits pretty well. Then um, when this columned hall uh, fell out of use, and this is quite interesting, again, for, for as an archaeological context, we have the last phase of occupation on top of the floor. Uh, so that's a phase where a lot of trash was actually 
um, left on the floor, not cleaned up anymore, and we can sort of even identify certain activity areas in this columned hall, which actually really um, changed my mind, at least, from what were these columned halls used for, because people have always assumed, oh, this is some grand architecture, like a palatial complex, but when you start looking at what people did there, it was used for a lot of different activities, from administration to um, food preparation and consumption. Um, there are also tools and um, other kind of objects, uh, more sort of daily life objects that were found there, and um, they're sort of concentrated in different areas. So let me give you a couple of examples here. So for example, you have in this area, you have a, a, um, a group of ceramic weights, a lot of pottery and, and uh, broken shirts, and actually a lot of ceilings that were found, clay ceilings, uh, discarded clay ceilings in this area. Very nicely, you can see the, the negatives when they ripped out the um, column bases after the um, abandonment. And then in other parts, we get, uh, for example, here we get a lot of limestone chips, which seem to have been from some sort of um, stonework activity or dismantling of some structure. I mean, impossible to tell. Here you have actually a lot of faunal remains as well and um, pieces of, of pottery. And um, that's a close up of these curious ceramic weights. Some people have published those as net sinkers, but they are, to be honest, far too heavy. And they always seem to turn up in these official buildings. So I wonder really what the kind of function is, but again, I'm, I can't really go too much into detail. We get imported pottery, very typical actually for the late Middle Kingdom, Levantine painted ware. Uh, we have quite a few shirts of those um, that were found on this um, floor layer. And um, just to give you a little uh, idea of the, the stratigraphy, which you can sort of see, I hope the shadow isn't too bad. The sh it's, it was difficult to take this picture very well. So you have various, these are the various floor levels, the phases of renewal here. And then um, right on top, um, this one, 2079, I'm hoping I'm pointing out the right one because I can't see this. 2079 is the uh, final phase of um, occupation. And then the abandonment you have is 2078, which is actually an almost windblown sterile layer of sand. So you can't have any better um, stratigraphy for the, um, for the whole use and um, abandonment. And I don't want to bore you with complex uh, um, images like this one. But um, basically, just to give you an idea that we have the, the whole uh, complete stratigraphy of this um, building from its use to abandonment and post-abandonment. So, and that's, um, that's really important to understand the, the context of these ceilings. And we can, of course, with this, uh, as you can, can see from this image, also determine when some of the column bases were ripped out, because they were actually ripped out um, sometime after the building had fallen out of use and the sand layer had accumulated on top. So, um, yeah, quite a um, detailed um, bit of evidence here. Now. Let's, let's get to the um, clay ceilings. So we have more than 2,000 clay ceilings from this columned hall complex, which, is, but which shows you very clearly we are looking at an administrative complex. So people were sealing and opening um, commodities, uh, doors, and um, this is actually very much in line with what we know from the late Middle Kingdom. Uh, the Egyptians had a very complex administrative system using scarabs and stamp seals, um, and uh, we get, uh, in, in, they use them in great quantities, and we get um, these uh, deposits of trashed uh, clay ceilings um, in such buildings. So this is, Edfu is not the only case of that kind of um, scenario. And um, thanks to my colleague Daphna Bentor, who has studied um, the motifs, uh, they are extremely well dated. So most of them can be dated to the 12th, 13th dynasty, what we call the late Middle Kingdom. We get decorative motifs. Um, we get in, uh, titles and names of, of officials. And from time to time, we get a, a royal name as well. And this is just a really small selection, and I hope you, you, get, the, you get the idea. Now, um, what happens, though, at the beginning, we, the, the first area we excavated was the southern columned hall. And we had no doubts about what we were looking at. Late Middle Kingdom, beautiful administrative complex, pottery fits, 
um, ceilings, everything fit together beautifully. And then we, get, we, we started excavating the northern column tall, and here is where things started to be much more complicated. Because we found about 40 of these ceilings, which have a cartouche you can see in the middle, and I'll show you more details. And they actually name the Hyksos ruler Hayan, who is somebody who was, is actually only known from the north of Egypt. Well, certainly not as far as Edfu. And um, as it always is with archaeology, the best finds are always at the very end of the season when you have no time. There's some rule to this. I don't know. Um, when we first actually found a couple of those, I mean, you, you can see from the scale, they are tiny, tiny um, um, fragments of ceilings. And um, so we were all looking at this. Look, oh, there's a cartouche. Well, we don't have time. Give it to the photographer. We'll look at this um, as soon as we have a good photo. And so it was actually a few weeks after we, we, we excavated those that we discovered what we had. And it, it really changed a lot, because this is the first time we have this uh, uh, Hyksos ruler's name as far as south um, in Egypt. And obviously, it has quite a lot of implications, because the, mere, the sheer fact that we have his name in Edfu also means um, we are not looking at the Middle Kingdom anymore. We must be somewhere in the Sangnan intermediate period. We define the Sangnan intermediate period with the moment Egypt loses its unification, and we have people ruling the north and people ruling the south. So with this name, um, it's very clear we are not anymore in the late Middle Kingdom. But how on earth does this fit together with everything else? And this opened up it's basically Pandora's box in a way. And those of you who worked on that material very much understand what I'm talking about, because it suddenly gets into history and chronology. And this is a period which, I mean, I'm sure some of you have seen the debate just on something like the Thera eruption. The chronology is a nightmare. And trying to fit Egypt into the whole Eastern Mediterranean. Um, and there's, there's been a lot of work on synchronizing um, different regions. It's, it's very complicated. So 41 ceilings. So it's not just the one ceiling, but 41. Um, naming this ruler, and you can see here very clearly the cartouche with his name in it, and he's called the son, the son of Ra on top, and the spiral pattern. Um, that's something that was there. They were known before, but they've never been found um, that far south. So we found them only in the um, northern column tall, which is interesting, and um, mainly in one context, which is right here, where we actually have a little bench structure. And it looks like there was a, a certain amount of activity with this specific opening of probably commodities in this specific area. And um, again, I have, a, I have a stratigraphy in a moment for you. So I'm talking about this uh, bench structure right here, which you can see very clearly on the picture. Um, you can also see here the, the various column bases that were uh, ripped out and the later silos sitting nicely on top, which we don't want to touch. And I don't think our Egyptian colleagues would let us. Um, again, here a close up of the, the mud bench structure with the um, floor level. And then a little um, um, drawing of the stratigraphy. The red layer is the one where all the Chayan ceilings were found. And we tested this at least twice. We were so anxious of absolutely, this is something you have to get right, because it has so many implications. You cannot have the slightest doubt about um, your, your context. You have to be really 100% sure. And um, so it's, it's right on top of the, the bench structure. So this is basically looking to the north. Also, you can see quite nicely the, the silo with the foundation trench here. So it's really, it's actually a, a quite a nice profile. Um, to look at. And then that's the, um, the other side where um, you can see the bench here again. The, and the ceilings were mainly found in, in, in this lay here. It's a bit, it's about 20 centimeters thick. And it has, uh, can be absolutely associated with the abandonment um, of the building of this northern column tall complex. So it's at the very end of the use um, of this building. Now, this is, is not the only um, ceiling that actually has a, a motif that is not from the south. We have um, over 100 of these, these ones here. We call this, um, <laughs> this motif flowerman, and you can understand why. 
Uh, you have to really, if you have so many ceilings to deal with, you find like little nicknames for them. So a flower man is a very much a very a good, well-established, uh, what we call late Palestinian series. So by this time, that kind of um, seal that produced that ceiling was actually manufactured in, um, in Palestine. So it's something that's absolutely associated with the north of Egypt and has nothing to do with the south. And here again, um, the various Hayan ones, and again, various fragments. I'm and now here comes the problem. So not only do we have these northern ones telling us that we're in the second intermediate period, but we also have nine of them, nine, nine ceilings that actually they're less well preserved that mention um, an Egyptian king who was extremely well anchored chronologically in the mid 13th dynasty, um, Sobekhotep IV. And now you have to start asking the question, how on earth does this all fit together? Because Sobekhotep IV and Chayan are usually 100 to 80 years apart in all chronologies and all textbooks. From the archaeological context, I think it's not possible that they are 100 years apart. And now, of course, I have serious arguments with my colleagues who come up with all sorts of ideas of how um, this uh, ceiling for this king was actually reused by later people. And that's why it turns up with the others. But um, I have some serious doubts, and I will show you why. I'm not saying they have to be exactly contemporary, but I think there can be some arguments made that Sobekhotep IV and Chayan should be put much closer together. And the problem is when you have overlapping dynasties and people ruling at the same time, how on earth do we ever establish for sure what this overlap is? So you have to have some really precise finds to actually um, be 100% sure. So some of the, the ones of Sobekhota were actually found um, very close um, to these uh, ripped out column bases. You can um, see in the holes here, but not in the holes. They were found um, in the, uh, still on the, on the floor level. So it's not a tra trash deposit that's like a secondary deposit of any sort. But we're all looking at um, yeah, pretty clear, um, pretty, pretty secure context. Uh, these ones were also found in the same layer, typical late Middle Kingdom, Egyptian, Southern Egyptian kind of um, ceilings. And um, I might come back to this if I have a little bit of time. Different areas of different ceilings show you quite clearly, and I want to discuss this actually in the workshop tomorrow a bit more in detail and not bore you too much with this. Um, but you can very clearly see the Hayan and the Sobekhotep, they are, they are both very much confined to, um, to the northern column tall, while there is some overlap um, with a few ceilings with the southern one. And I think what that actually shows us is the southern column tall was abandoned first before they abandoned the northern one. I think there's, there's no, no question about it. So um, what I hope I was able to demonstrate is that we are looking at archaeologically speaking, a secure and sealed archaeological context being associated with the use um, or the, yeah, when, they, when the commodities were opened and the ceilings were broken and discarded. So it's not something that's a fill layer or a mixed context of any sort, but it's actually something that can be associated with a specific building. Um, then uh, one of my graduate students, and I hope my slide will change, yeah, uh, Natasha Ayers is writing currently her dissertation on the ceramic evidence from, these, from this building, from the column tall up to the silo. Um, so she's covering a substantial amount of time. And um, because we have such a good stratigraphy at Edfu from a settlement context, she's been able to actually identify for the first time the early Sang intermediate period, because a lot of the material before has come from cemetery context, which is much more difficult, especially when you see a lot of reuse of tombs. So Natasha, um, who also took part at the um, conference in Vienna uh, last summer, was actually able to demonstrate in front of some experts like David Aston and so on, um, Manfred Bietag, uh that she can really make a case for the specific evolution of pottery in the early second intermediate period in Upper Egypt. And um, Upper Egypt is doing a very different thing from what the north of Egypt does at the time, which makes co complete sense looking um, at, the, at the development. 
And the Middle Kingdom tradition carries on much longer in the south, which we can also see from the ceilings as well, much longer in the south, while in the north things change much faster. So again, I don't want to go um, much more into this. But so right now, the first result is um, simply before we have, as the history books tell us, the Hyksos kings and the Thebans having these fierce wars, we actually seem to have some economic or diplomatic con contact between the two. So there's no question that there's certain shipments of commodities for whatever reason arrive in Edfu and being opened in Edfu and originate um, from the north. Of course, if you want to be 100% sure, uh, one possibility would be to look at um, the clay, uh, the clay composition of these ceilings, and see whether we can find any, you know, um, chemical mineral components that actually really show us that um, they come, they were made with clay from the delta. But that also means, can we, uh, the clay in the delta, hopefully, is different from the clay in the south because you do, you don't know. I mean, we haven't really, this is something I want to do with uh, my colleagues at Taladaba. Um, I also, I'm pretty convinced that the end of the 13th dynasty, so the late Middle Kingdom, is overlapping at some point with the early 15th dynasty. And um, we can now say that Khayan is certainly, and that actually has been, thank God, accepted by almost everybody. Khayan is an early Hyksos ruler, and he's not. He and Apophis, the much, uh, he, Apophis is the other really well-known Hyksos, are not consecutive rulers. So there is actually a gap between these two. There's no way that they were following each other. So these are some first results. Now, um, that leaves us with a chronology that's still pretty much open. And as you can see just from, from this, um, from this uh, image, there are lots of question marks around here. When the, do we really see the start with the second intermediate period? We, how, when do these, um, when do the Hyksos come in? Um, and this is just a, a, a suggestion, and I think we need more data to be 100% um, sure. But now um, I would like to go to Tel Daba, the, um, the site for the Hyksos, excavated by uh, the Austrians since the, I guess, 1960s, Miriam, right, 1960s? Um, by Manfred Bitak, and now um, uh, the direction is um, by, lies by um, Irene Forstner Müller, and um, it's this Eastern Delta site. And I'm sure those of you who work in the on um, various regions in the Eastern Mediterranean know that Tel Daba has been often used to synchronize um, the chronologies in the uh, Levant, and especially in. Um, um, the southern uh, Palestinian uh, region. So, as you probably also know, there are some issues um, with all this, but uh, I don't want this to turn into um, a fierce chronology debate. <laughs> um, so, Hayan ceilings at Tal Daba, so the capital of the Hyksos, you would expect that's the kind of place where you'd actually find a lot of these ceilings um, in, um, yeah in various settlement areas. Tel Daba is quite different from Edfu as it's uh, covering a much larger area and it's been excavated in certain parts, quite detailed actually. Um, and the two areas that uh, actually have shown the Hayan ceilings are pretty recent excavations. So that's uh, w this one here, area F2, excavated by Manfred Bitak, where he found a palatial complex, complex of the Hyksos, which he calls the Palace of Hayan since 2006, and then um, in 2009 or even later, Irene Fosner Müller started excavating up here. It's not even on that plan yet. Um, R3, um, which is a domestic um, urban area of the Hyksos period. So let's have a look at the first at the palatial complex. <coughs> Um, a nice complex, certainly, and I completely follow Manfred Bitak in, this is um, the Hyksos period, not necessarily Egyptian layout, with quite a lot of interesting features, like um, one of the main contexts, which is this offering pit. Extremely large um, offering pit, L81, which you can see marked down here, actually had multiple depositions of um, probably um, trash from large feasts that were 
yeah, several times deposited and buried in the ground. Um, they have more than, what was it, more than 1,800 diagnostic shirts from just this trash deposit. Um, there are different episodes, but the pottery is actually um, the same throughout um, these episodes. So it's pretty short period of time when this was deposited. And among a lot of other objects, there were clay ceilings. And um, what is interesting is they have the same mix as we have in Edfu. So you get, and again, some people come up with different interpretations, but I just want to lay out the fact first. So we have rulers um, like Neferhotep I, who is also very well anchored, mid-13th dynasty, and then you get um, Hyksos uh, ceilings. These ones are pretty much broken up, and you can just see the Heka Hasud, which is the title of the Hyksos, ruler of the foreign lands, 15th dynasty, no problem. Um, and you have some that are mentioned men, that mention Hayan. They are a little bit different from ours. As you can see, they don't have the spiral um, decoration, nor the cartouche, nor the cartouche, nor the um, title "Son of Ra." But um, they, these ceilings actually exist in both versions. So you have the ones we have um, at the same, probably well, it's been always assumed at the same time as as these ones, just reflecting different titles. Um, then in uh, area R3 at Tel Daba, which um, has been excavated recently by Irene, there's a domestic area dating to the Hyksos period, no problem. And um, here, a, um, a larger corpus of about 470 clay ceilings was actually found, unfortunately, all of them in secondary trash deposits and fill layers, a lot of them being um, under the actual buildings you see on the plan. And um, again, in some of these um, ceilings of the Hyksos ruler were found. And again, the same mix of um, late Middle Kingdom, Seng Intermediate period motifs. Now, of course, as you can already see both, and we agreed in the workshop, none of these are like sealed archaeological primary context, but they are actually all secondary deposits. And um, it's understandable that you can come up with various explanations for having this um, mix of different um, periods together. But now with view of the Edfu evidence, I wonder whether we should um, look at this a bit differently. Um, just one thing, the area R3 also had actually one of the um, uh, ceilings that looks exactly like ours with the spiral design um, and the cartouche. So you get spirals, you get the cartouche. And it's interesting that it was found in, in, um, in an earlier trash deposit than the others. I'm not saying that necessarily means that this motif is earlier than the Helka Hasud um, uh, naming um, Hayan, like these ones. But it's, it's interesting, though. So where does this leave that? That leaves us with like this um, rather complex chronology, which I'm sure you've all seen. Um, different um, areas in Tal Daba being um, not only put in relation to each other. So since they, the excavations have been focusing in different areas, it's of course quite difficult to actually sort of connect um, the various areas chronologically. And one of the main means to do this is obviously the ceramic evidence. And um, it turns out that um, the, in both, uh, at both areas, the Hayan ceilings were the earliest time, the earliest phase where it turns up is E1, or um, then um, Manfred Bietag has a lot in area F2, which is actually D3. So that's um, the kind of uh, yeah, phase in Atal Daba. Now, I should also mention that at these, this workshop in Vienna, Irene Forstner Müller pointed out that this thing they call datum line with Ahmose is completely hypothetical and is actually not true anymore. They've, that, that's been um, based on an interpretation and not really on um, you know, the King Ahmose the, who reunified the country and starts the new kingdom. Um, it's not like any remains have been found that can be dated exactly to, to his reign at this point. Also, you, I would like to point out that the absolute dates here should be taken with a grain of salt because um, the radiocarbon dates from Tal Daba that were published um, not that long ago, actually, in one of the radiocarbon journals, show that there is an offset of about 120 to 150 years between 
what the archaeologists would like to date things up in, in terms of absolute chronology and what the radiocarbon dates tell us. And there has been a huge debate on this, and as I said, I don't really want to get into that. So, what do we do with our evidence from Edfu now? Um, there's still this big question of overlap of different dynasties. Um, how can we um, account for this mix of late Middle Kingdom tradition and second intermediate period? Um, again, in the Vienna workshop, we had a huge discussion with Daphne Ventor, who basically says, in the second intermediate period, scarabs are no longer used as seals for the central administration. And she says that as soon as the, um, Egypt politically falls apart, we don't have any more scarab workshops um, that produce these ceilings, and any um, ceilings that, were, that are found um, together with second intermediate period motifs are people reusing old seals. So that argument has been brought up, and it's hard to argue against it, because, I mean, first of all, what do you do when you have not a single scarab workshop? And we don't even know where the Middle Kingdom capital, uh, we don't have any archaeological trace of the Middle Kingdom capital um, called Ichtawi, which is supposedly somewhere near Lisht, but we don't have neither um, the archaeological evidence nor a scarab workshop, nor do we know that, the, the, um, that scarabs were only produced in the capital and then distributed to officials elsewhere. And that's, that's a problem, because people really stick to that. And um, I hope tomorrow in the workshop we can, I can make, give you a little glimpse of what I think could be a case made for um, scarabs were also locally produced in different areas of Egypt, which makes so much more sense in a way. But it's very hard to argue when you don't have the evidence to, to, to really back it up, in, not in this way nor in the other way. So um, let me just finish. Here are the, the couple of points I've already um, mentioned. So when does the administrative system of the Middle Kingdom really end? Does it end um, with um, the Hyksos being in the north, or does it actually continue sometime parallel with the Hyksos period, with the Hyksos being um, um, ruling part of the delta? The whole question of the royal residence, each Tawi. We know it from textual sources. We know it was the royal residence of the Middle Kingdom. When does it get abandoned? Is this really where we start to see the beginning of the second intermediate period? Some people have suggested um, the last ruler we know um, is Mer Neferai, who's a king that, uh, who had monuments apparently in the Delta and in Upper Egypt. But when you start looking at the actual evidence, None of the evidence in the delta is something that couldn't be also explained by people reusing certain stuff, especially when you have inscribed stone blocks and so on. So not quite clear uh, for him. Um, so by Kotep IV and Haiyan, traditional chronologies put them 80 to 100 years apart. I have a problem with that. I don't think they are. They should be that far apart. But of course, that means if you put these guys closer together, there's a whole other way of, yeah, you have to still account for um, how this fits together for the absolute chronology. Scarab workshops, the only scarab workshop we know about is one that was actually at Taladaba, and that has been um, confirmed. Um, you can see uh, the, both um, the excavation uh, results from Manfred Bietak and Irene Forstner Müller, they were obviously still using scarabs at the time. So does that mean the administrative system is not functioning or uh, functioning in a different way? And um, the question I brought up earlier, do we have workshops only at the royal residence that produce scarabs, or did people also have workshops in other parts of the country? So these are a lot of questions, not a lot of um, firm answers yet, but I hope that um, the evidence from Tel Edfu is putting, giving another, adding another piece to the puzzle. And hopefully at some point we'll be able to try to solve this whole problem of the overlap more precisely. Thank you very much and I hope you have a lot of questions. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> first of all, you're not <coughs> suggesting 
actually collapsing the time period. No, 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 no. I'm okay because that has been brought up a lot of times. I don't think there is a lot of room for collapsing anything. Right. However, when you start looking a little bit more at like um, our, one of our best uh, sources for chronology is the Turin Papyrus, right? right? So unfortunately, that papyrus, for those of you who are not aware, this is a complete king list that actually has, is our best source for um, rulers we don't know much about in terms of monumental architecture, but we also have like the reign length for these rulers. The papyrus is really fragmentary. It fell apart, which is a tragedy for Egyptology. Um, the Hyksos entry, we only have the last name of the Hyksos, Hamudi, preserved. And then we have some regnal years, but we can't put the rulers to it. And they are two really long, like really long, meaning 20 to 40 years. Yeah. And it's been always assumed this is Rayan and Apophis because these two were um, the ones we know best from the Hyksos. But now everybody agrees they are not consecutive. So there is obviously some other Hyksos that ruled for a longer period. So I think there is some space in there that can be moved. Okay, second question. Okay. Um, <laughs> Sorry, this is getting really like nitty gritty here. Second question. You've actually got two different kinds of crayon ceilings. Yes, you that I wonder about. Yeah, exactly. And you have the, what looks like Hekka Hasut. Yeah. Um, it's generally assumed and seems to be true that they started out calling themselves Hekka Hasut. That's what, yeah, that's what people and think. And then yeah. only towards the end did they, they actually use the take on royal. Egyptian titularies. So, two possibilities, two different kayans. How? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, or he's the first one that does it. And you have yeah. uh, a beginning yeah. phase yeah. and then a. Interesting, phase. interesting though that at Tel Dava, the one where you would say logically, and I follow your logic here completely, the, the Sahara one is the one that was found in an earlier context than all the others. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. It's not, it's not easy. More it's about that. More. OK. Yes, Miriam. Um, thanks for that talk. That was great. Um, and I agree with you in many, many different points. Um, how do you see the, like, the evidence of the Chayan ceilings connected with that recent find of the old Babylonian letter <laughs> fragment in the same context? Yeah, that is, that's also a problem. I have to say, I don't really know much about old Babylonian, so I don't know how, it, you know, how well this is actually anchored. But there's one thing I, I do follow. Um, Chayan is actually one of the few, um, actually the only Hyksos ruler who's attested elsewhere in the Eastern Mediterranean. So he seemed to have had a lot of contacts with other regions. And that would fit very nicely to that evidence. However, all of this comes from these trash deposits. I think the, the letter is from a well? It's from the well. Yeah, it's from a well, yeah. So I think that's more for, you know, what do you make of this old Babylonian? Those of you who know about this better than I do. Chronology-wise, does it fit? Well, it's a very, very yeah, small fragment, and I also don't know much about uh, old Babylonian, but they seem to be pretty sure about the dating, and that would fit perfectly well with the older with the older Chayan date that we have. Yeah. Well, as long as it's throughout little things, well, yeah. Anything, any other question? Um, can you um, say, I'm super interested in that column tall, and you said you have some evidence from the Nubian fortress. Um, so what is the comparison here? And is it part of, a, oh, okay. of, a, of what complex yeah. you have to think what it actually is? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So f of course, at first, when we first started excavating the, the columned hall, I was like desperately looking for columned halls elsewhere in Egypt. And it's, for that period, really difficult because most of the times, and you know that, uh, Nick knows that too, that when you go to like sites like Abydos or Tel Daba, they all have a very set layout of, of um, buildings that were used for residential and administrative purposes, and it's very different from that columned hall layout. So um, I couldn't find any parallels to the north, but I did find at Buhan, the command building it looks almost, there's one columned hall in the middle, 
um, that looks very similar to what, what we have there. So it's a Nubian fortress, a planned government installed structure in Nubia, so south of, quite a bit south of, of um, Edfu. But um, I mean, if you start looking, we don't have that many tell sites that are excavated on a larger scale for that specific period. So that obviously hinders a little bit the comparison. So I'm sure there must have been others, but yeah, I don't have anything apart from Wuhan. Yes. So I, I am not an Egyptologist. I work primarily in the Eastern Mediterranean. And oh, so you probably know the whole debate with the chronology. Well, I have a, I have a completely general question. That yes. Yeah, is that, could you explain that, pre, in that chronology slide? Which one? The, this that one. one, yeah. Yeah. So this is out of sheer ignorance. If you, if you resolve that overlap and if you, if, you, if you figure out how the succession happens then, what does that, why is that important for Egyptologists? What, what is the relevance of that? Well, I mean, so first of all, it has some real implications for yeah, for, for on a chronology level, but also on a on a historical level, that we don't have that we we have this like falling apart of a political system earlier than we we thought we would have with the um, you know these foreign rulers coming in, and the, as as we know now now as well is like um, at Tel Adaba, these foreigners started to settle already in the Middle Kingdom, but they didn't call themselves rulers of anything. They were, they were simply a presence. And then with the Hyksos, we have people ruling and actually assuming royal titles. So um, it really changes, I'd say, it changes the nature of how we reconstruct the history of the Sang Intermediate period, that these foreign rulers that installed themselves in the, in the Delta were actually pretty much, I mean, from what I can see in Edfu, they were having um, contacts with other parts of Egypt and actually exchanging goods, and they were not fighting each other. If you look at the textbooks, all you hear about is the Thebans fighting the people in the north, and we know this actually shows you that it started off ex very differently. There's there's no way for the the warfare situation only comes at the very end of the period. So the obviously the Egyptians, I don't know to what extent we can say they didn't have a problem with the people in the north, but they were obviously trading with each other. So that was really something that that is, is pretty new to the whole part of history here. Yeah. Is there any way to know what these commodities were and, uh, and what the uh, possible trade relations uh -huh. were based on the what was coming from the Asiatics, you know? <laughs> well, it's, um, that's, a really, that's a really good question because obviously also has a lot of implications. So um, I will, t tomorrow in the, in the workshop, I want, I want to show some of the sealing back types because the back types actually show us what, they, what commodities were being sealed in terms of, it only gives you the container. It doesn't give you necessarily what was in it. But um, we have, um, evidence for wooden boxes in large quantities, baskets, um, probably, well, we have some cloth imprints, fabric imprints, which could either be bags or, I don't know, I can imagine like folded linen of some sort being wrapped up. Of, um, yeah, so we get, we get these types of containers. Now, what were they actually trading? Um, huh. Difficult. I, I'm not sure that we really we really know that at this stage. We have like imported. You can go for imported perfume or wine or pottery. I don't know. It's it's really hard to make out. But we do know one. And I always believed that. And Miriam, feel free to contradict me here. I always saw the the Hyksos and the people before them, the, these foreign settlers in the Delta, being sort of tradesmen who would actually have an extremely good connection with different regions in the Eastern Mediterranean and be actually form like a trade hub in bringing in other commodities um, into Egypt. So um, yeah, we, I don't think we, we have such a good idea of what kind of specific commodities. Miriam, I mean, feel free to add something to this since you have actually worked at Tel Dava, so. Yeah, no, I totally 
everything. Copper, wine, oil, everything. Resin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Although it's interesting, you didn't mention ceramic vessels as a major type. You think boxes, linen. Yeah, you see, there's the thing. So ceramic the vessels would be my expectation. Yeah, but um, very difficult to understand from the ceilings because um, the ones with the fabric, I have seen. Um, actually, I think Elephantina has well, has an example of a complete jar that was covered with fabric, and then you have the the string and the ceiling. So of course. The fabric ones are the tricky ones, unless you see really the the, the negative of the, the actual pot, which can be done, I think, but it's much rarer. So, yeah, the fabric ones are a headache. Nick? Well, I'm just following on that. Are, is mud stoppering, just your standard mud stoppering mode of closure, prominent? And you get a lot of mud stoppers in these mm. contexts where or does it look like? We have, some, we have some in this context, yeah. They were, we get a lot of these mud jar, not very attractive type of object, but we have quite a few of those, yeah. Any stamps? No. No stamps whatsoever at this point, which is, we are looking very hard for the stamp one, but no. Unfortunately, that would be too nice. <clears throat> yeah, well. Oh, sorry. We take one more question. Yes. Great. So I find, I think what you're saying here is really compelling, and um, especially this sort of your suggestion of a more potentially peaceful or at least mm -hmm. diplomatic sort of connection between the North and the South. And I was wondering if you could speak more because I'm not particularly, I work earlier, and so okay. I don't know exactly the details, but I thought I remember Torok mentioning that there's some um, ceilings of Hyksos and Nubia, and also the story of this 13th Dynasty Vizier um, having labels up or ceilings in Tel Adaba as well. Um, okay. Sneber, Sneberau, or something like this. Um, so I was just curious if there's other evidence that you can speak to or elaborate on that could also sort of help with this suggestion that I think so, is compelling, at least for Edith. And I wonder if this. That's a, that's, a really, that's a really good question. So um, let me, maybe I should just quickly put up, a, I'll put up a map here for the, so that you get an idea of the regions, which makes, illustrates this a little bit better. Let's put this one up here. So um, what we do know at the um, Sang Intermediate period, so not only do we have people um, taking over the delta, but we also, Egypt loses control of um, Lower Nubia, which was actually uh, for a long time um, sort of in the Middle Kingdom, pretty much controlled by the Egyptians. And um, there are some suggestions. Well, there, there's a bunch of Nubian fortresses built along the Nile down here that were built by the Egyptians. And once the administrative system, the political system falls apart, these um, fortresses are not abandoned, but they are actually people, Egyptians among them, staying at these fortresses. And, um, and some of them, they have been um, clay ceilings. They were, yeah, clay ceilings have been found that actually also date uh, also fit very much to the northern um, tradition. And there is like the, the Orn Arti one, which I'll talk um, a little bit more tomorrow in the workshop. Um, there is some suggestion that the, the, that the um, Nubians had um, also quite close contacts with the, with the Hyksos. And we know from the wars, but I don't know whether that's really representative, that they were actually connected, connecting very nicely by the Oases. Um, I don't know whether that's really, really true for the, for the beginning of the period. But um, one could also imagine that if, if they were um, trading with uh, Upper Egypt, that why not going further south in the, same, in the same goal? So there's certainly a connection there. And there have been less, um, less in quantity, though, but there have been a couple. Um, there's instances where, yeah ceilings have been found in, in, in Nubia as well. So for, for Tal Daba, um, there is actually a lot of, I mean, what you were mentioning of these late, uh, that's a late Middle Kingdom um, official, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So th that fits very m much what, we, what we've seen um, in, in, in these areas, that you have these um, titles of officials, what we call, we call them private name um, ceilings, that are typical for the late Middle Kingdom. We have them in Edfu as well, and they fit. They're the yeah late Middle Kingdom, and they turn up in, in Tel Daba, which actually would very much fit to what I've just said with um, connections in terms of, of trade and exchange. But um, 
as I mentioned also, Daphna Bentour thinks very much this is all, all of those are basically people reusing um, scarabs at the time. They're not new ones being produced. Hard to argue against that. Are any of your ceilings, cut, uh, do they, any of them display two different impressions? Oh, yes. Counter ceilings, yes, we have that. So, oh, yeah. So they are using yes. seals to seal. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Whether you call that administration or not, yeah. counter sealing implies yes. checks. And they have them at Taldaba, and we have them yeah. as well. It's no like problem. Four ceilings, yes. And I'm showing, I will show a couple of those tomorrow in the, in the workshop as well. No problem with that. Perhaps we can thank Nadine <laughs> again and, and enjoy a glass of wine. Thank you.